So, here we are, once again, in the middle of Advent, the time of waiting and preparing for the coming of the Lord. Um, those of you who are of particular acute eyesight will notice that uh, in our nativity uh, scene over there, uh, there is yet no baby in the manger. The baby has not yet arrived. Not that you'd know it from all the Christmas displays that are all around the place everywhere. Yesterday, as I drove our new friends um, back from uh, the airport, um, they were amazed at all the lovely Christmas decorations festooning the shops throughout the towns that we passed through. And of course, coming as they do, as I said earlier, from a, a strict Islamic society, such displays of Christmas are rather unusual to them. Of course, I explained to them uh, that I don't really approve of all this pre-Christmas celebration. According to the church calendar, Christmas doesn't start until the 25th of December. Christmas trees and Christmas decorations absolutely should not be taken out of their boxes until Christmas Eve. And then, of course, they should all come down 12 nights later, shouldn't they? Yes, I can see enthusiastic nodding from some of you. Good. <laughs> but such traditions mean very little to the world around us, do they? The merchants of the world, in particular, can't wait to start selling all the presents and the Christmas tat uh, that they want us to buy. Do you know, this year I noticed at the pub next door, um, I, I, I should confess, I do occasionally go to the pub for a a lemonade with members of the congregation. Stop laughing. Um, <laughs> I noticed in August that there were signs in the pub inviting people to book their Christmas dinner. That's how, how far ahead of the curve they were trying to get. <laughs> but, you know, woe betide the grumpy vicar who tries to push against this tide of consumerism and profit-making. There's a story about a predecessor of mine here at St. Faith's who once made the rather grave error, it turned out, of banning the playing of Christmas carols in the church until Christmas Eve. I'm told that this was not a popular decision, especially with the members of the Mother's Union. And I can hear Sandra giggling, which tells me this is a true story. Sorry? It was, yeah, you weren't in the Mother's Union, okay. Well, apparently the, the problem was that the Mother's Union wanted to put on a Christmas fair and they wanted to play Christmas carols. But my predecessor, quite rightly, quite rightly said, no, we shall not have Christmas carols before Christmas Eve. You know, history tells us that both I and my predecessor are by no means the first Christian leaders to be suspicious of it all. During the brief years of the English Republic, under Oliver Cromwell, Parliament passed a law in 1647 that banned the celebration of Christmas altogether. The Puritans, who were at that point in a period of brief control, thoroughly disapproved of all the drunkenness and the frivolity that comes with the secular feast of Christmas. They disliked the waste they disliked the racking up of debt for the purchase of Christmas presents, which poor people could barely afford. Special services, like midnight mass, uh, were, were banned. Feasting on Christmas Day was banned. And fines were imposed on anyone who ignored the ban. Shops were compelled to be open. Now, I have to tell you, this was not a popular measure with the local populace. There were riots in Kent and in other parts of the country. In, nine, in 1652, so five years later, the government reinforced the ban with even tighter rules. But, as you'll know, ultimately the Puritans lost the battle, and after the restoration of the monarchy, the full excess of Christmas returned with a bang. One of my worries is that commercialised Christmas is a millstone around some families' necks. This is even more the case at a time of steeply rising costs of living. 
There are families all over this country who seriously worry about how they can afford to give their children the mountain of plastic toys that children expect today. Some will go into considerable debt so that their little darlings won't think that Santa loves them less than the child next door who did get a mountain of toys. Worse still, at a time of environmental crisis, with COP, is it 28 or 29, that's just finished? Well, Christmas requires the cutting down of millions of trees for wrapping paper and cards, for crackers and party hats that we will use for an hour and then throw away, let alone the actual trees that we will cut down to display in our churches, yes, and in our homes. No doubt huge quantities of oil are used in the manufacture and the shipping of all of these plastic toys wrapped in yet more cardboard to be played with once on Christmas Day and then donated to charity shops and to rubbish tips in the weeks after. It's depressing, isn't it? And there's little I can do to shift the public mood. Like John the Baptizer, who Jesus spoke about in our gospel reading just now, I feel like a voice crying in the wilderness. Make straight the highway for the coming of the Lord. In other words, make your path, your highway towards Christmas, one of increasing holiness, increasing charity, increasing reflection on the deep truths of the earth-shattering, paradigm-shifting nativity of our Lord. But I know I'm wasting my breath. So, like many who feel as I do, I shrug my shoulders, I switch on the Christmas lights and attend the rolling carousel of pre-Christmas school concerts, turkey dinners and festive uh, occasions of all different kinds, until with everyone else I slump exhausted into my chair on Christmas Day. People are rarely ready to hear the radical message of Christmas, the uncomfortable truth that Christmas doesn't arrive with Santa, or with stockings, or mince pies, or turkey, or plastic toys, or mulled wine, or Christmas trees, or concerts, or greeting cards, or crackers, or lights. Christmas arrives in the depths of darkness, with the cry of a baby utterly dependent on the love of his parents, born in poverty, born to die, born to raise the sons of earth, born to give them second birth. The birth, that is, of the Spirit of God within every human soul. Christmas arrives with the attempt of a king, Herod, to kill God's revolution in its cradle, just as Palestinian children are being killed right now in those same streets in the land called Holy. Christmas arrives with a radical message of peace on earth, sung by angels, calling humanity to a new way, a better way, the way of radical forgiveness and the constant quest for peace. Oh, hush the noise, ye men of strife, and hear the angels sing. John the Baptizer was a bit of a Puritan. He was a bit of a radical. And that's perhaps why Jesus later said of him, as we heard this morning, 
that he was greater than any other person of woman born. By his choice to live apart from the world, eating locust and honey in the desert, calling the people to radical change, to repentance, to baptism. John was planting his radical no to the customs and the waste of his own time. But there's a sting in the tail. For as we heard in, the, in this morning's gospel, as great as he was, John, Jesus says, is less than the least in the kingdom of heaven. It's an odd phrase, isn't it? As great as he was, the greatest person yet of woman born, he is nevertheless not as great as the least in the kingdom of heaven. What does Jesus mean? John's response to the waste and the violence and the greed of his time was to stand apart from it all, to disappear into the desert and to, to live off the meager offerings of the land. But Jesus brought the kingdom of heaven into reality. And he didn't do it in the desert. Jesus arrived in the midst of humanity, in a town so crowded that he had to be born in a stable. He lived alongside people, feasting with them and celebrating with them and being one of them, but also apart from them. This, then, is the trick that we inheritors and progenitors of the kingdom need to learn. Being a grumpy old moaner about the waste and the frivolity of Christmas, like I am, actually gets us nowhere in terms of advancing the kingdom of heaven. Running away, screaming from the silly season may be very appealing. And I'll be honest, I've, I've often thought of hitching up my caravan and just disappearing for the last two weeks of December. But that's what John the Baptist did. Being born into the muck and the chaos of humanity, that's the way that Jesus did it being present for the poor, for the poor shepherd, for the misguided wise man, for the homeless drunk, for the struggling parent. That is the way of the Lord. That is the calling that each of us are given. That is why I embrace the Christmas trees and I embrace the frivolities, and I embrace the concerts, and I embrace the celebrations, because I hope that in the middle of it all, somehow we can communicate something of the reality of the deep, profound, paradigm-shifting message of Jesus Christ. And that, my friends, is the true message of Christmas. Amen.